This is a story that my father has told me multiple times. My dad is a logger, specifically one who operates a tree saw, which is basically a giant machine that is capable of cutting down massive trees and cutting them to a specified length. This means he spends a lot of time alone in the deep forests. The way my dad's logging crew was set up is that he would be told where he was supposed to cut down trees, and he would go do that and be paid based on the amount of trees he cut, not on how long it took him. So, my dad used to work 16, 20 hour days constantly to get done as quickly as possible, and then the rest of the crew would come clean up the trees and ship them to the mill. He used to work around 50% of the time alone, and the rest of the time with another tree saw operator named Rene. They would use radios to communicate back and forth when they were working together. This is relevant down the line. Sorry for all the backstory, but this is the start of the story. My dad and Rene were put on a new job site, and they were about 10 days in and everything was going as planned. But they were constantly hearing weird chitter chatter over the radio that was such poor quality no words could be heard, and whatever radio channel they changed to, it followed them. As they progressed through the job and went farther up the mountain, the words from the radio slowly became more audible. Both of them agreed, based on the small parts of conversations they could hear, that something was wrong. They also started finding weird containers all over the place and signs that people had been here. People should not have been here. This was a two and a half hour drive up a mountain. They had to spend three weeks clearing out the road so their trucks and equipment could make it up. They come to the realization that they are in a very secluded area with people who shouldn't be there. And the worst part is that they aren't scheduled to leave for about another week. They would only leave to refuel the fuel truck with gasoline for the machines. They would buy supplies and sleep in campers. One day, Renee comes across a tent and calls my dad over. They investigate the tent and find one lone sleeping bag and a duffel bag. They investigate the duffel bag and find many pairs of children's underwear and things that appear to be a rape kit, like rope, duct tape, sketched images of children being molested, and photographs of children that appear unaware they are being photographed. In the tent, they also find a small amount of food which includes canned goods and an apple, which proves the tent has been occupied recently because there was no mold on the apple. They are now on the mountain alone, which at best case scenario is just a really messed up individual. Renee instantly wants to get the heck out of there, but my dad, being the hardest working person I've ever met, insists that they need to finish the job and get the heck out of there. They decide that they will not talk over the radios except in cases of emergency and see if they can hear something over the radio. They are now in close enough range of whoever has been talking over the radio to hear the conversations between two men about collecting water and wood for the fire. Nothing abnormal, except for the fact that these guys don't belong here and that the tent was undoubtedly theirs. At the end of the workday, my dad hears them on the radio talking about one of them collecting brush for a fire. My dad hops on the radio and attempts to communicate with them about what the heck they are doing. I believe he said, who are you and what are you doing here? After this, the conversation between the men abruptly stops and they never pick up. That night, Rene wakes my dad up and whispers for him to get his gun. Someone's outside. My dad has told me that the first thing he hears when he wakes up is the quiet shuffling of footsteps. My dad fumbles for his gun and finds it, but realizes that he doesn't have it loaded and has little clue where his rounds are. And Rene has nothing. And the thought of calling the police is absurd for multiple reasons. They hear a jiggle on the doorknob and it opens. The camper is far enough off the ground that you had to jump in, and there's no ladder footstool. It just stays open, and neither my dad nor Renee moves. They hear scratching right outside the door, though. After four minutes of scratching, my dad can no longer take it and nods at Renee. He gets up quietly and walks towards the camper door, and the second he reaches it, he is met with intense pain across his right eye all the way to his left cheek. He has been cut and falls out of the camper, hitting the ground hard. A man with a knife gets on top of him, and he is soon being kicked in the top of the head by a man behind him. Renee leaps out of the trailer and manages to get the man off my dad, and my dad gets up and realizes that the second man without the knife is running away, and the man with the knife is scrambling away from Renee and starts running alongside his accomplice. My dad and Renee get into the truck and drive to the nearest hospital to treat my dad's cuts and later report the events to the police. They both quit their jobs, 
and two weeks later, as the rest of the logging crew was finishing up the job, one of them was found gagged, bound, raped, murdered, and thrown into a ditch. No one has ever been convicted of these crimes. To this day, my dad can hardly see out of his right eye, and the pupil is disfigured and looks more like a cat's eye than a human's. He suffers from PTSD due to these events and hasn't slept a good night's sleep since. Hope this was worth the read, and I will try to answer any questions you have in the comments. This story ended up being much longer than I had originally anticipated, and I apologize for the long read. I will say that in all the years I've told this story, people usually respond, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. So I hope you take the time to enjoy it. This story occurred in the summer of 2008. I grew up in Oregon and was acquainted with the outdoors at an early age. My favorite hobby came to be hiking, particularly in areas that are either very dangerous or isolated. The health benefits of hiking were secondary to the thrills of walking the edges of exposed cliffs, being in cougar and bear territory, and knowing that I was far from help. Into the Wild was released in the fall of 2007, and I immediately fell in love. Being a high school senior, I could barely go another week living in my parents' house. The movie spoke to my sense of adventure and inspired me to hike the California portion of the Pacific Crest Trail upon graduation. I made it from the Mexico border to Northern California without much incident. I saw rattlesnakes and black bears, experienced dehydration, but nothing happened that made me fear for my life. Somewhere in the Lassen National Forest in Northeastern California, I walked around a bend in the trail only to be startled by two people sitting on a rock dressed in nearly all white. Their faces were dirty, their appearance disheveled, and the man had a long, unkempt beard. Both seemed to be in their 40s. They looked like the couple who kidnapped Elizabeth Smart. What struck me as odd about the encounter was encountering anybody at all. I frequently went days without seeing a single human being. Their white clothes could be explained away by the need to escape the California summer sun. Their scruffy appearance could be explained away by the fact that most thru-hikers abandon personal hygiene on the trail. After I said hello, they said nothing and simply watched me as I passed. Even that I didn't find odd. I chalked it up to them being foreign and not knowing what to say. I camped a few hundred yards off the trail that night, as I always did. Following bear precautions, I hung the leftover food I had cooked that night from a tree approximately five feet off the ground. Packing up camp in the morning, I noticed the food wasn't there. I immediately thought a bear had entered my campsite, and so I began to look for paw prints. I didn't find paw prints, but I did find boot prints circling the campsite, two pairs of them. One of those prints led right up the rope from which the food was hanging. I thought of the couple I had passed earlier, and everything clicked. I quickly packed up and left. My mind was racing the entire day, but I figured the couple was simply hungry. If they had nefarious intentions, they would have come for more than the food. Several days passed, and my mind was at ease again. I had begun to circle my campsite with sticks to wake me in the event of an intruder, animal, or otherwise. I awoke in my tent one night to the sound of those sticks crunching. I grabbed my hunting knife. I tried to relax by telling myself that in the middle of nowhere, the source of that noise is much more likely an animal than a person. Then I heard frantic whispering. It was impossible to tell which direction the voices were coming from. Being in the dark surrounded by trees, a hundred miles from the nearest city, plays tricks on your senses. I debated yelling out, claiming to have a gun, but instead decided to be silent and retain the benefit of surprise. I heard footsteps circling my tent and was ready to slash at whatever opened it. But just like that, it was over. No more footsteps, no more whispering. I lay frozen awake in my tent until sunrise and opened my tent to find nobody there. The only evidence something had actually happened were the boot prints, the same as before. Several more days passed, and I was now in Shasta National Forest, probably 50 to 75 miles from where I first encountered the couple. The trail became more or less a goat trail. Being on the side of a mountain and above the tree line, I could see the trail winding for miles in front of and behind me. I stopped for water in the rare shade and noticed two hikers miles behind me. 
All I could see were two white dots moving along the mountainside. I immediately said out loud, Forget this, this trip is over. I pulled out my map and looked for the nearest town, which appeared to be Castella, located off I-5. The only problem was that it was 25 miles away. I hiked well into the night trying to gain as much ground as possible. I kept losing the trail and decided to set up camp, this time far off the trail and into the forest. I got in my tent and tried to sleep, but every little noise kept me awake. After a few hours in my tent, I heard the telltale signs of another bad night. The footsteps, the whispering, the sticks breaking. Sound travels far in the absence of other sound. I knew they were close, but wasn't sure how close. All I could think was, this is messed up, this is so messed up, God damn it. Finally, a flashlight hit my tent, lit up the entire thing, and went dark. I unzipped my tent and climbed out, carrying my knife, yelling nonsense into the dark. It was sort of like that cliché scene in movies where people in the wilderness hear sticks breaking around them, and the camera pans around the trees because the people have no idea which direction the sound is coming from. Then I heard footsteps running towards the tent and barely made out a figure moving in my peripheral vision. I turned and ran deep into the forest. I tripped several times and ran into several trees. After running for approximately five minutes, I tripped, rolled, and came to rest next to a downed tree. I got under the tree trunk and lay still. I saw the flashlight moving around in the distance. I lay under that tree for hours. I was certain they were gone, but I didn't move. Eventually, birds started chirping, and I knew sunrise would come soon. Once it did, I made my way back to the trail, abandoned my campsite, and walked the rest of the distance to Castella, where the Pacific Crest Trail crosses I-5. I hitchhiked my way to the town of Mount Shasta and spoke with the police and forest service. They put me up in a motel for the night, and my parents drove from Oregon to pick me up the next day. I followed up with the police and forest service months later, who told me there had been similar reports of items disappearing from campsites throughout the surrounding national forests. However, there had been no other reports of the terrorizing that I experienced. As far as I know, nothing ever came of the couple. So, this one might be a bit long, but I need to go into it slowly, so bear with me. My boyfriend and I love to camp. About two weeks ago, we decided to go to the coast because we had a Friday off from our classes at the university and decided to hike and camp out for the weekend. We had a three-day plan to stay in three different towns and hike to each place. This story is about the first place we stayed in. The first town was barely a town. It was more like a bunch of small houses and farmlands with very few people. It was off-season, so normally there would be some tourists there, since the main attraction is a huge abandoned city left over from the times of the ancient Greek civilization. Anyway, since there were five, six camping grounds available, one of which was highly recommended on TripAdvisor and the likes, we didn't bother calling beforehand. We simply headed there and then straight to that camping area. Upon reaching it, we saw the gate open, not really so unusual, but when we entered, no one seemed to be there. We knocked and called out for someone and no one responded, except the outdoor bar was all open with expensive bottles of alcohol lined up and food left on the kitchen table, as we saw from the window, so they couldn't have gone far. My boyfriend found it a bit strange they would leave everything open like that, but assuming it was a small community with no crime, we didn't think more of it. We went to some other camping grounds to ask if they were open. The first one we went to said they were closed because their grounds were very messy these days, but they recommended us another place. We asked them about the first ground we had gone to, and strangely, the man said, don't go there. When we asked why, he said, eh, just don't. I don't really recommend you going there. Anyway, the other place he told us about was also closed, and luckily, in the meantime, I found a signboard for the first place, and it had their number on it. We called them, and a man picked up and told us that he and his wife, who run the place, are out for a couple of hours, but we'll be back by the evening. He said we could set up our camp and that we would meet later. The place was a bit secluded, but it was quite picturesque, and we set up our camp and left. We spent the whole day exploring and hiking around, and after a tiring day around 10 p.m. after dinner, we started heading back. This is where things got extra creepy. When we got back, we found the place still empty. No one had returned, and it was quite late. My boyfriend called up the owners again, and they said they had decided not to return tonight, 
but that we could leave the money under a table mat by the bar. They said the kitchen and bathrooms were open if we needed to use them. The place was dark and the yard where we had set the camp up was huge and without lighting. My boyfriend immediately started to feel a bit uneasy. He was concerned why two business owners would leave their property completely open to two total strangers, with a bar full of unopened bottles and a half-open house. As we walked towards our camp, he kept subtly expressing his uneasiness and kept looking around. He's usually pretty calm, so I told him if he's really feeling so strongly about this, we can just go to the pension where we had dinner earlier and stay the night there in a hotel room. He opened the flashlight of his phone and kept looking around, getting more and more uneasy. We agreed to pack up our camp and leave. I began to pack it up since it requires a lot of folding, and he was already anxious. I told him to just stand and give me light as I packed it up. Except constantly, he would move the light and check the area, and I kept getting irritated because I could sense his worry, and at the same time, I couldn't pack fast enough because I couldn't see. At one point, he even told me in a slightly annoyed way to hurry it up, and as soon as I folded the camp, we stuffed it into its bag and hurriedly packed our things and left. He still seemed super anxious, and I told him to relax. Just telling this part gives me chills all over again. The road back to the main area of the town was dark and lonely, and this is when he told me, there's something I wanted to say, but not while we were still in the grounds. Well, what is it? I asked. He hesitated, then said he didn't want to freak me out, but he was sure that he saw someone lurking in the dark behind the wooden cabins and by the bathrooms, twice. No one was supposed to be there except us, I got the chills, but I still tried to rationalize, saying it's a farm area, there are lots of animals. Maybe a cat moving around. But he was adamant it was a human figure walking like a human would and standing. That is why he kept checking and wanted to hurry so much. And that's why he was telling me to hush up and keep my voice down. I almost had tears in my eyes at this point, and the hair on my back was standing. I kept looking back and almost running at this point to the lighted area of the quiet town and only really relaxed when we reached the pension, booked a room there, got the key, locked, and checked it twice. I am generally a skeptical person, but I really do believe my boyfriend didn't just see things. I don't know who that was back there or what could have happened, if anything, and I don't care to know. Dark and isolated places have always creeped me out anyway. A person lurking in the dark, let's never ever meet.